and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 35. I'm Charlie Place, and joining me today is the author of many books set in Cornwall, including The Cornish House, One Cornish Summer, and the book we will be discussing today, The Path to the Sea. Hello, Liz Fenwick. Hello, how are you? I'm very, very well. How are you? Good. Excellent. That's good to start on. You're originally from Massachusetts. You travelled all around the world and you chose to settle in Cornwall. And I, I know you've had this question before, but I'm going to have to ask it. Why Cornwall? I have to sort of blame my husband on that one. When I met him shortly after I arrived in the UK, he took me down to Cornwall to meet his parents, or so I thought. In truth, it was the Cornwall test. <laughs> if I hadn't fallen in love with Cornwall at that point, I don't think we'd be coming up to our 30th wedding anniversary. So it's very definitely, I fell in love with Cornwall on that June weekend. Was there anywhere else that you were thinking you might have liked to have settled before that? When I upped and moved from the Boston area, I assumed I would be settling in London, to be quite honest. I had no idea that Cornwall would become home. But in some ways, it made complete sense, since I was very connected to Cape Cod as well. And at one point, I joked I should write an article about the ice creams of two places, because I grew up next to a fantastic ice cream shop on the Cape called Four Seas. And around us here, we have a fantastic Roskilles ice cream. So from Cape Cod to Cornwall, but both of them have the sea and that's probably the biggest connection. And something I'm going to have to ask, do you like Cornish pasties? Love them. <laughs> I have to restrict myself to once a month because they're almost a full day's calories in one. <laughs> so I'm going to look back now before you're publishing. You first looked into publishing years before you eventually published, I believe, in your 20s? I, for my equivalent of the senior thesis or dissertation, my senior project, I wrote three quarters of a novel called The Irish Woman and working quite closely with one professor. And at the time she had given me her agent's name and I left university, three quarters of the novel was written. She had told me to send it and I didn't. Years later, when I picked up writing fiction again, I Googled the agent of the professor and thought, what have I done? Because this woman was the agent for Frank, Frank McCourt. And I thought, oh God, there was a golden opportunity. But actually it was the right thing to put my creative writing aside at that point, because even then I was trying to write the fiction I write now and I didn't have the life experience. When I left university at 22, things were very much black and white to me. It was right and wrong, and there was very little in between. And coming back to writing fiction in my 40s, I had had children. I'd traveled around the world. I'd lost people close to me, forced to make decisions that life forces upon you and realize that actually black and white doesn't really exist. Nothing is as clean cut and What's really, truly interesting is the shades in between. And I didn't have that experience at 22. And I didn't have the thick skin. My first book came out when I was 49. And at that point, I was pretty sure of myself in the sense that I'd made it this far. I'd finally had a book published. And if you didn't like it, that was absolutely fine. At 22, I think I was a little too delicate. Well, that's a very inspiring story. And anyone who's thinking, oh, no, you know, I'm, I'm taking a while to get these books done or that sort of thing. I, I hope it does inspire them. So we should move on to your book proper. We're talking about The Path to the Sea. So 2018's Heatwave Summer, and I think we can all recall that one. Joan is dying and her husband, George, has called her daughter Diana and granddaughter Lottie home to Boskena, their house on the Cornish coast. It's near St. Austell Bay. Diana arrives reluctantly. On this weekend, 56 years ago, in 1962, she lost her father and Joan still hasn't told her the entire story. Lottie is more willing to come home. She's lost her flat and her work to a lying husband and is happy to return to her grandparents. So as the weekend begins and continues, we hear the stories past and present of each woman and the conflicts and secrets they must work through whilst together. Liz, you have a reading from Diana's point of view for us. I do indeed. It's right at the very beginning of the novel. It's um, the second chapter, as a matter of fact. And before I begin, I have to say that the structure of the novel is written continuous through the time clock 
of the days of the weekend interweaving past and present. So this is the 3rd of August, 2018, 12 p.m. St. Austell Bay gleamed in the distance as Diana Truin turned left towards Porthpine and Boskenna. Once she had longed for Boskenna with everything that was in her. Every night she would clutch her pillow to her chest and pretend she could hear the sea. Then she would dream. In those dreams, she wandered the sunlit rooms, seeing glamour and hearing the echoes of music and laughter. She would discover new rooms and new treasures, and then she would wake and the world around wasn't as bright or as beautiful. Those dreams still came to her, mostly at times of stress. She escaped to those visions of blue sea and sky, big lawns and a library filled with every book she could want. No real house could live up to what her mind had created. Last night, she'd had that dream again. She'd walked Boskena's halls, seen the views and discovered new rooms. It was all achingly familiar and yet entirely new. Something was forever just out of reach. She had always assumed that it was her father. If Diana found one more room or the right book or the correct shelf, then a secret door would open and her lost childhood with her father would appear. He would tell her that he'd just been playing hide and seek. She was his fierce huntress and she had found him, but no book or panel or secret door would reveal her father, Alan Truin. The morning light always showed the truth. Boskenna wasn't a place of delights, but a big drafty dwelling housing two old people. Now, she was just moments away and the lane narrowed, funneling her towards the beach. A sharp turn and she was through the gates. Yesterday, the call that every adult child expects and dreads when their parents reach a certain age had come. Your mother's dying, George Russell, her mother's second husband had said. She wasn't sure how she felt about returning to Boskenna or about her mother, but that didn't matter. Some things have to be done. She parked next to George's old jag and grabbed her overnight bag. A shiver of recognition and home covered her skin as she walked across the gavel drive towards the house. She'd only been back to Boskenna a few times since she'd left it as an eight-year-old. Her heart had broken then and a few more times since, and now it was whole, if patched. It performed its job a bit like the roof on the caretaker's cottage to her left where a bit of blue tarpaulin covered an eave. Outside the front door, she stopped and turned to the bay. The heat of the sun beat down on her and the happy cries rose up from the beach. The world went on while somewhere inside her mother was dying. She paused, feeling that sharp contrast between life and death, between holiday world on the beach below and the everyday life in Boskena. Even back in 1962, when she spent her last summer holiday here, Boskena existed on a different plane she had tripped lightly among the intelligent and the interesting, the sun-tanned and the salt-encrusted. That was all she remembered because tears had erased the important bits. A seagull landed on the lawn and peered at her. The tilt of his head asked her why she was here. Duty, she guessed. She pushed a piece of gravel with her toe. Diana and her mother, Joan Truin Russell, had nothing to say to each other. They hadn't for years. If Diana were honest, this was a sadness she had sought to lose in her work. Traveling the world as a war correspondent had filled the void for years, but now she was slowing down and that left gaps. Unwanted thoughts and questions had begun to seep into the spaces. Looking at the lawn, a memory of playing tag with her mother flashed in Diana's mind. She was laughing and so was her mother. Once they must have been close, but since her father had died over 56 years ago, that had evaporated. Her mother loved Diana in her way. Diana had wanted for nothing except her. Everything changed, and she knew it was because of that long weekend 56 years ago. Boskena is very important in itself. It's the ancestral home. It's based on a real house. It is. It's based on Porthpeen House, which was also the house that was used in the film About Time, the last Richard Curtis film. And I had fallen in love with it when I had seen the film. And for me, when I'm writing, I have to know where the book is set, setting and house, usually a house, is vitally important to the story to me. And while researching, not idly looking at houses one could rent that had been in films, I discovered that the house was for rent. And I knew then that kind of pulled all the pieces that were floating around in my mind together. Once I had my location, that was it. And then I rented it. I looked it up. It's quite expensive. Did you take quite a few people with you? I did. I needed to know two things. 
it was in fact this time in 2017 that I had rented the house and the house sleeps 21. I had never been in a house of that size, let alone tried to run and organize it. But for the Easter weekend, I filled it with 21 people, mixture of ages. And I, on the Saturday night, so Easter Saturday, I forced them all into black tie, vintage if they could find it. And we had a dinner that was fairly retro. And I included in the guest list one of my middle son's friends, who is a brilliant pianist. And he played on the piano and we had cocktails to that while we were all in black tie and laughing. It was really quite fun. And the evening went on and I could feel the experience of what the house was like when it was full. And the weekend finished, we were down to five of us in the house. And that gave me the feel of what it must have been like for George and Joan to be living in the house as just two. And also staying in the house changed it really dramatically because for one Cornish summer, I used the Dolphin House and I rented that as well. And the atmosphere in that house really changed the writing of that book. And Pospin is a very happy house. That sounds like bliss. That does sound like a Mm -hmm. lovely thing to do. We are recording on Easter Saturday. Yes. This is very strange because, of course, your weekends are matched up as well. And, yeah, this this is all coming together quite well. (laughs) So (laughs) to move to these weekends, the past and the present weekends that you look at are the same dates. They are. It's just one of those magic things because I knew I wanted to set the historical setting in the Cold War, but I didn't have a year picked. And just flipping through newspaper articles about the Cold War and initial research... I was looking at some articles in 1962, and 1962 was the last year that the August bank holiday was on the first weekend in August, not the last, which we're used to now. And I was writing the book in 2018, and I thought, oh my God, the dates are exactly the same. It's meant to be set in this year. And that's when I had the brilliant and absolutely mad idea that I would set it over the long weekend, the same dates, and follow the story round the clock, which seemed a brilliant idea of planning. I put myself in a terrible box, (laughs) got there in the end of how to reveal the story between the three narrators over a course of a weekend. Yeah, I mean, when you're reading it, the amount of info that's there, you do have to sit back and go, this is a weekend, because there is so much detail in there. And I was wondering, when you're planning it did you ever have to keep up yourself with the events and how they're all weaving in together yes in the past when i've had a historic narrative woven through many times i'll initially start out weaving the modern day and historic and then i will stop and i will write the historic narrative then interweave with this one halfway through i wrote joan's full narrative When I hit the halfway point in the weekend, I needed to know exactly her timing and how everything happened. Then I went back and completed the eight-year-old Diana's narrative, which is vital to the story, and wrote Lottie's, and then wrote the elder Diana, because I really struggled with her. She was so... She was my least favorite character in the first draft, (laughs) and I had to... (laughs) I had to really sink myself into her to find redemption I'm not surprised I mean I do have a question here was she frustrating to write I mean she's both understandable and a bit frustrating as well I think to read Mm. Um, she was frustrating particularly in the first draft I probably didn't know her as well as I should and I think the contrast of writing an eight-year-old Diana and then a 60, she's 64, 65-year-old Diana was very different because the years in between really formed her. As an eight-year-old, she's charming, she's inquisitive, she's intelligent, she's all the things that make a character quite fun to write. But when we see her as an older woman, she is closed down. As a writer, it takes patience she required patience in the end she's now my favorite character but she certainly wasn't when i was writing the first draft yeah i should clarify that when i say frustrating to read it that is the adult diana the child Mm. is something different completely i noticed that you've got the narratives and we're kind of third person for lottie and 
Diana, but first person for Joan. What was the reason for that choice of narrative for Joan? One, she's first person and she's present tense, which is unusual for me because I rarely choose that unless it's very short, vivid pieces. But I just felt to experience what she was going through at that point, we needed to be fully inside her and seeing it from her eyes. I think anytime you have a first person narrative, you question the reliability of your narrator. And I wanted that in there as well. And I chose present tense because that sense of not knowing what's up ahead was important. You know, you were experiencing it as she was. Interesting. I mean, the thing that struck me, particularly near the end, as things draw near, is that obviously with Diana and Lottie, you've got them active in the present day. Mm. And of course, Joan isn't as active, of course, because of her situation. And then, of course, you continue it after things have happened. Staying on Joan for a moment, one of the major factors in the book is that Joan and a few other characters, but focused on Joan, were spies in the Cold War. Were you inspired by any real life women spies in the Cold War? I think once you start digging in to the history of the Cold War, you realise, or actually in the history of spying and wars in general, how effective women were as spies. I mean, I'm researching book number nine, which is dealing a little bit with the SOE and um, going into France and the fact that women were less noticeable. And the same certainly applied in the Cold War. Nobody anticipated that the housewives were as much actively spying as you know her husband who was known to be a spy because of his role in the embassy as political attache that was almost like putting a banner out saying here i am a spy (laughs) Um, whereas the wives were definitely more useful in the sense that they were less obvious so there wasn't a specific woman in general but there are many stories of many women through that period who used their role as housewife to gain a lot more information. Well, I did think it was fascinating that part of the thing that kept the mystery going for me and kept me involved with the story was that sometimes it was difficult to tell what was genuinely Joan hosting and what was her spying. And, I mean, you've got this book that Joan keeps, this book with recipes in it and place settings and what people liked and what they didn't about the meals. Uh, Where did this come from? (laughs) That actually comes from my mother-in-law. My father-in-law was in the advertising world and my mother-in-law entertained on a level that today looks extreme. And the spark for the story was my husband is the youngest in his family and these dinners would be going on and he'd be in the kitchen with, of all people, I mean, their help at the time was called Mrs. Bun. Um, So he'd be in the kitchen with Mrs. Bun by the serving hatch, waiting for his favourite foods to come back. And I suddenly thought, what if a child witnesses something that they don't understand at the time that impacts their life terribly. And then combined with this notebook that I was given when my mother-in-law died, her daughters didn't want it. And it was another writer friend of mine going through it one time when she was visiting us here in Cornwall. And she said, oh, you need to write the Cornish Supper Club. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that. But as I looked at the detail of what she put in every dinner party that she gave, and she was doing three and four a week, was detailed to a level that was, you know, you just don't imagine today. I mean, I'm sure in the royal household, they know the preferences of everybody, but, you know, It was down to who was sitting where, what she was serving, whether the people ate it or not, and also making sure that if they came back again, she wasn't serving the same dish. And many times she made a note of what she wore on the evening. And I just thought, oh, what a different way of life. (laughs) So I grabbed that. I grabbed the experience of my husband because he had walked in in the middle of that, said, oh, God, I remember waiting for the pigeon and peas to come back, his favorite dish. (laughs) So your mother-in-law wasn't a spy, but that connection isn't there. No, no, that connection definitely isn't there. But I had heard a story from somebody else who, after their mother had died, discovered that she was a spy and they had been in the world of embassies and so forth. And of course, Joan had grown up in that world as well because her father was an ambassador. So, yeah, I think this person was quite surprised to discover that 
she had expected some spying on her father's part, but she had not expected any on her mother's. And her mother was the main spy. Goodness. Yes, that's quite something to uh, find out about, definitely. Shall we have that reading from Joan before we continue? Yes. Okay. It's not much further along in the book. It's chapter 14, and the chapters are very short in this book because we're jumping through the days and the clock. The other thing I want to say before I read, and if any of the listeners have heard me read before, is I am dyslexic, so I can tend to stumble as words don't necessarily stay on the page. And if you compare what I'm reading to what's actually on the page, it might not be the same. So this is chapter 14 in its Joan. It's the 3rd of August, 1962, and it is 6.10 p.m. Diana sits cross-legged on the bed watching me while I clip on my earrings. Thus far, today hasn't gone as planned, and now I am faced with a handful of guests gathering in the drawing room for drinks. Tom would be among them, of course, but there would be eight others. It is paramount that I find time alone with him before tomorrow afternoon. Mummy? I turn to her. She wears her serious look as she clutches the present that Tom has given her. Yes? She holds a leather-bound book aloft. Uncle Tom said this is a diary or a journal. I nod and I perch beside her, taking the book from her hands. Flipping through the line pages, it is apparent that it is not made in England. At a guess, the leather work indicates the Middle East or possibly Spain at a stretch. She looks up from under her long, dark lashes, so like Alan's. I can write things down, like what I do every day. Indeed, your thoughts about all sorts of things, too. I hand the book back to her, or even sketches. But there are lines on the page. She runs a finger over one. True. Trust her to worry about that. You could slip your drawings into the book, she frowns. No, this isn't a book for my drawings, I don't think. Okay, then you could write in it like you do to your best friend. But that's Maria. Well, your next best friend, then. But do remember that some things must never be written down. She looks at me as if she despairs of me. Of course, mummy, I know all about secrets. She wrinkles her nose and I hide my smile. She is so like Alan, quick, mercurial, and ever so clever. Uncle Tom said I was good with words. Did he? Turning, I look at her closely. Yes, he said I might become a writer or even a newspaper journalist when I'm older. Very perceptive. Perceptive, she asked, tilting her head. He sees things well. I stick another hairpin through the French twist in my hair. Did he say where it was from? Beirut. Memories of 1955 and that glorious city filled my mind. Dancing, laughing, loving. They speak Arabic there, don't they? She turns the book over. Yes. Isn't that written back to front? She peers at me, and I love watching her thought process. My darling girl is so intelligent, it scares me sometimes. I stand and smooth my dress. You're a clever soul. Thank you, Mummy. She jumps up, clutching the book. Maybe I'll begin writing in my diary from the last page. I chuckle. That's a super idea. Make sure you tell Uncle Tom your plan. I stroke her dark hair, loving its thickness. He'll be pleased. She stares at me. I think I'll become a journalist because I like to ask so many questions. You'd be a very good one. Would I, Mummy? She takes my hand. Absolutely. You're curious and very good with words. I like knowing the truth. Her bright smile disappears and her eyes narrow. The truth is very important, I say. But I know that much of the time it is best hidden. The truth can hurt. One more question on the Cold War. Were there many people who kept Cold War era secrets for life or for so long? I believe they did. They were under the Official Secrets Act. And I think once it gets into your blood, it stays there. And the reason I say that, I'm going to jump to another book, The Returning Tide and my mother-in-law again. My mother-in-law is a huge source of inspiration for me. She was a a telegraphist during the war, and she was working the night of the Slapton Sands disaster or Exercise Tiger. And she was actually working with the Americans. And one night we were sitting around the table at their house and had been something in the newspaper about it. And she simply said, I heard them die. They stopped using code and they went to plain language. I heard the men die. Mm. And later on, I pressed her about this. And I said, you've got to write down your story. And she said, yes, yes. And kind of 
passed me off and so forth. And she did never write down her story. And I realized when she opened up about that, she was still under the Official Secrets Act. You know, she shouldn't have spoken about it at all. And can you imagine holding that inside for that length of time? So I think those that were dedicated to their countries, which Joan was and my mother-in-law was, or anybody else who takes on that role, we definitely hold things close for a very long time and not release it because it becomes part of them. Yeah, yeah. Interesting to know. Completely different subject here. Why did you choose to create a similarity between the things that happened to Alan and Lottie's friend, John? Mm, um, I like having reflections in books and in different times and in different ways and to make people look at different angles of things and how things can happen. And also to see doubt in people's minds. There is also a true story of some deaths that took place on the promontory there that I didn't know about when I wrote the first draft of the book. So, I mean, there were certain echoes of lots of things going on. So staying on Lottie, but different question. What was the significance of Alex and Paul, the men in Lottie's life for the book? I wanted Lottie to be a lot more vulnerable than either her mother or her grandmother in that sense. And I think because of the relationships between the three women and how they worked, I felt Lottie had to be the most vulnerable. And Paul shows that vulnerability. She stupidly pushed one away when she shouldn't have and that was kind of because circumstances intervened so yeah it was more to show her vulnerability and how she had changed and grown as an individual even in the course of a weekend fascinating i know when i was reading i felt very strongly in a way that these were kind of not bit characters but definitely minor characters and they felt so much like a support and also kind of showing the changes of time i thought well Again, going back to the structure of the book where I'm telling the whole story in one weekend and yet at the same time trying to reveal the lives fairly fully of three people. There has to be characters that can be pulled on screen that will reveal that to do so. But Lottie was a tricky character in the end. and Even when my editor was pretty happy with the book going forward, I just knew that I hadn't nailed what Lottie actually wanted and I would go on what I'm known for my plot walks and normally I try not to think about my books directly when I'm out walking because it allows my brain to weave things together but I do recall walking around saying I had a a friend and a fellow writer down with me doing what we jokingly call as a book boot camp where we're hard at work on books at the time and I was going around what the f does Lottie want and saying it with each footstep and it wasn't until the end of the week that I had actually figured out what Lottie wants now you're going to ask me what that is and I'm afraid to say at this point having just completed another book and I'm you know 40,000 words into another one I can't remember that's absolutely fine I think there's something for readers to find out something I would like to ask very much is why did you start the book on Lottie and Alex? I originally had written the book with a prologue of Diana's journal as an eight-year-old on a page I won't stay now but I'm sure you can realize there's one where she writes down something very definitive that she was at fault for Mm. and that was how I had the book and my editor didn't feel that that set the right tone for the book. She wanted something that was a bit more uplifting. So I went back in time to Lottie's past to bring that forward. That would make it a different book in a way. Well, it definitely brings her to the fore, I think, where she might have been not lost, but, you know, lesser than otherwise. I think that is absolutely true because normally the first character that a reader meets on the journey is the one that they take as the main character that they latch on to and hang on to. And to a certain extent, Lottie is responsible throughout the book for actually finding the secrets and healing the past, her own, her mother's and Joan's. She was definitely a driver when I was writing. 
um, I wanted her to be the one that uncovered things. Well, with that then, is there one character who is the most important to you? (laughs) Um, In this particular book, I think for me, the one I had the most joy writing is the character of Tom. And that is purely because he was a character that was in the Cornish house as an old man. And he was old Tom, as he's referred to in the Cornish house. And he had walked on the page because the young teenager, Hannah, needed him. And to suddenly step back in time and see Tom as a young man and how he came to be old Tom and a bit of a mentor was really fascinating. So that was one of the joys of writing the book for me was to spend time with a character that if you asked a majority of my readers who's their favourite character if they've read all the books and old Tom is up there without a question of a doubt. So that was a joy. But as I mentioned, actually now my favourite character is Diana herself. That evolution or evolution of her from naive in joyful eight-year-old to a, I won't say she's bitter, but I suppose she is bitter, woman that has lost so much, not only her childhood, but many other things. That was an answer that seemed to come out of left field for me. That that was quite surprising. I did not expect Tom. (laughs) I'm going to go back and read that book now, The Cornish House. Well, I mean, it's it's my first book. I would do certain things differently. The story, I think, is still powerful. And old Tom, I am absolutely passionate about and it was tremendous fun to envision him as a young man as opposed to an 85 year old man and for those who had read the book and then read the path to the sea they will have seen hannah in the graveyard scene so there's a little nod to that when diana encounters hannah there because my books are not a series in any way shape or form and they can be read as standalones but for the most part they're set in a fairly small world the first six of them are all set around the Helford River the path to the sea is the first one to kind of venture further away but it was fun to pull that in and previous characters which I think I as a reader enjoy when I'm reading a book thinking oh so that's where they are now you know um, Hannah from the stroppy teenager from hell in the Cornish house is suddenly going off in the world doing something interesting and it's not a lot if you hadn't read the book she's just a walk-on character but if you have read the previous books you'll have seen her in the Cornish house a Cornish stranger she makes an appearance in under a Cornish sky it's a little present I mean the book that's coming out in June the river between us is the first that I haven't got a character directly linking back But in writing the book that I'm writing at the moment, there are characters from the previous world of books that will be brought in as walk-on characters. Maybe it's lazy of me as a writer, but having these wonderful characters, even the secondary ones, I don't have to recreate them. They're there. And for a reader that has read the backlist, it adds a certain richness, but it doesn't take away anything, I think, from a new reader. Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, I totally agree. It's lovely as a reader when you can see these connections. It makes you feel more part of the proceedings almost as well. Mm. Do we know what, or could you tell us in your view, because we don't hear in the book, what happened to Salome? The dog. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. She was brought back from Oscar and lived out her days with the family as soon as Joan was allowed to move again. Well, I know it sounds kind of well, maybe bonkers that I've asked, but I think I have been reading quite a few books recently where, you know, there's wars and things going on and the dogs are a sad part of the story. Having lived all over the world and encountered animals being transported, and particularly if they're in the um, diplomatic side of things, animals are moved around all the time. And Salome would have been sent back to the UK, obviously had to go through quarantine and all that rigmarole, but she would have been fine and loved. (laughs) That's lovely to hear. You have mentioned The River Between Us. Can you tell us more about it, please? Really fun book to write. The River Between Us is set on the banks of the Tamar, both sides, Devon and Cornwall, so a bit of a departure for me. Entering into the realm of where do you put your clotted cream or your jam on your scone at what time? I find that the Tamar absolutely fascinating and the history of how it divides two 
lands to people. And while crossing Horsebridge, which is the oldest bridge still in existence crossing the Tamar, I just felt stories around me. And we stayed at Hotel Ensley, which is on the Devon Bank, which had been the hunting lodge for the Dukes of Bedford when it was built in 1815. I just knew there was a story set there in World War I. And I set out to write a story of a forgotten cottage, forgotten crossings, forbidden love, and a look at the period leading up to the war and after the war and the effects on it. What I didn't want to write, although in my research, I ended up reading the complete annals of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. So I knew where certain characters were at certain times. And when I say I've read the whole thing, it is a doorstop of a book. I didn't want to write a book of World War I as such, because there's so many beautiful ones that have been done. But I did want to tell the story of women's lives, and particularly how restrictive an aristocrat's life could be and what was expected of them. So the story talks of Theo in the modern day, who is a newly divorced woman who buys a ramshackle old boatman's cottage on the Tamar, and also the story of uh, Lady Alice Neville, who is the daughter of the eighth Duke of Exeter. And I'm not ruining anything in the story by saying that she speaks out about votes for women and the force feeding of women and gets banished to Abbotswood and her life changes from that point onward. So just a great fun, and I'm rambling on about, about it. I should have a pat two line summary of the book. It was a fun book to research and explore and to write around key historical events at the same time as making a modern day story that resonates with it and echoes the past. Well, I don't know about rambling. I mean, this sounds incredibly compelling and you've brought in (laughs) various different themes and ideas here that have just made it sound better and better. It's out in June. Yes. Yeah. The 10th of June. Brilliant. So mark the day and look for pre-order, everybody. Cream or jam first on the scones? Oh, jam first. Absolutely jam first. I love clotted cream. Um, So I put a, a nice, ideally homemade raspberry jam some people prefer other jams but i like raspberry best and a thin layer and then i can pile it high with clotted cream and it doesn't slip off okay you're making me hungry now (laughs) listeners links to purchase the path to the sea and to pre-order the river between us are in the episode description along with my email address if you have enjoyed this conversation do subscribe or follow for future episodes Liz, this has been wonderful having you on today. It has been wonderful spending time hearing all the backstory of the book and things that I didn't expect. And also everything about your your mother-in-law and everything there has been wonderful to hear about. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's been great fun. The next interview will be on Monday, the 26th of April. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 35 was recorded on the 3rd of April and published on the 12th of April, 2021. Music and production by Charlie Place.